Cash from the EU to help Tunisia curb migration. Nearly 2,000 people from Africa have died so far this year trying to reach Europe across the Mediterranean. So how can the bloc square keeping out migrants with its human rights obligations? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. The Italian and Dutch Prime Ministers and the European Commission President have been in Tunisia to sign a deal on financial aid. Part of that will pay for a clampdown on migration. People wanting to start a new life in Europe have travelled to the country from across Africa and elsewhere. Tunisia has been accused of a racist policy for expelling people now trapped on the border with Libya, where they're barred from entering. The EU allows migration from Ukraine because of the country's war with Russia, but it's paying to prevent African migrants reaching its shores and helping other countries like Libya that face allegations of abusing migrants' human rights. We'll shortly be discussing the EU's migration policy and the rights of those seeking a better life in Europe. But first, a report from Al Jazeera's Sara Haidat. They thought they were heading to a better future in Europe, but those dreams came to a sudden end. Tunisian authorities rounded up hundreds of black African migrants and left them stranded on the border with Libya. With a war that's been going on for years, the Libyan authorities refused to help, leaving them in a hot, barren stretch of desert with very little water or food. Some are injured others pregnant. Along with their children, they've endured long journeys, mostly from sub-Saharan Africa, and now this. We are dying one after the other. My brother is gone. It might be me today. It might be another person. Please, we are begging you people, save us from this deadly place. But the government doesn't want them in Tunisia. While migrants are being helped by some local people, tensions are high in the border town of Sfax, and others have been arrested. That's after a Tunisian man was stabbed to death last week in a fight with several migrants. Human rights organisations have called for emergency aid and shelter to be allowed in as soon as possible. The Red Crescent has reached some, but many have yet to be rescued. We are not thieves, we are migrants. We are not killers, we are migrants. We are just looking to build up a good life, you know. We are not criminals, we are not thieves. So like... Tunisian President Kais Saied has previously been accused of making racist comments when he blamed migrants for the country's economic crisis. On Saturday, he said migration into Tunisia is criminally organised. We are Africans and we cherish our African identity, but we refuse to be a land of transit or a land of settlement. This is not regular immigration, this is a displacement operation. It's supervised by criminal networks that traffic human beings and organs and aim not only to make money but to also destabilize the country. Tunisia's economy has been struggling for years with soaring debt, high inflation and unemployment. That's pushed some Tunisians to risk their own lives by crossing the Mediterranean to reach Europe. The International Organization for Migration says 1,895 people have died or gone missing en route from northern Africa across the sea so far this year, including hundreds of children. Just over 2,400 died on the journey in all of 2022. The European Commission President as well as the Italian and Dutch Prime Ministers are in Tunisia to discuss aid. The European Union last month offered the country more than $1 billion to help its economy, but it's come with caveats, including reinforcing the border to stop migrants from journeying to Europe. Human Rights Watch has accused the Tunisian government of the collective expulsion of black migrants. It says about 200 have been left to fend for themselves at Tunisia border with Algeria. Some have already died. It's not clear what President Saeed's long-term plans are to tackle migration or whether a deal with the IMF that he's rejected before could help reduce migration to Europe through Tunisia. Away from politics, deals are being discussed. But hours have turned into days and days into nearly two weeks, with many migrants still not rescued. Sara Khairat for Inside Story. All right, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Rome, we're joined by Ferdinando Nelly Ferrocci,
president of the International Affairs Institute think tank and former Italian ambassador to the European Union. From Tunis, we're joined by Reem Ghafi, a human rights uh, and anti-racism activist. And from London, Tarek uh, Mejrisi, who is a uh, senior policy fellow on the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, Tarek, let's start with you. Given the erosion of democratic norms in Tunisia, the fact that President Kai Syed has rejected the terms of an IMF loan and has said that his country won't become a border guard for other countries, why would the EU think that loaning Tunisia 900 million euros to help its economy, including 150 million to help it address migration, would be a good idea? Well, thank you, firstly, for inviting me on. Um, to be... To to clear things up, firstly, the 900 million is um, linked to the future acceptance of an IMF deal. Uh, at least that is what the EU and, and some of the member states have been at pains to, to put across. Uh, the additional 150 million to, to police the border, so to speak, uh, is the, the real question. And, you know, I mean, why, why would it be a good idea? It's probably better to say why they would believe it would be a good idea. It's essentially doubling down on the only policy which they know uh, and the only policy tool that they believe that they have in the box. Uh, unfortunately, this approach hasn't worked in the past. It hasn't worked in Libya. Uh, and over the past year of them trying it, migrant numbers have only increased. So uh, it doesn't bode well. Will this EU aid package, if indeed it, it goes ahead, do anything to ease the migrant crisis or make it worse? Um, why does the EU think it's so important to bolster Tunisia's economy, given, as I said, the erosion of democratic norms there? Um, I'm not sure I've got correctly your, your question, but because the uh, volume is not particularly well functioning. But uh, broadly speaking, I think that uh, European countries uh, in general and those countries that are in the southern part of Europe, particularly like Italy, Greece, or Malta, or Spain, have a very strong interest in the stability of Tunisia for many, many reasons. The uh, management of migratory flows is not the only reason. And uh, we are very worried on this side of the Mediterranean for the crisis which is affecting a neighboring country of ours, like Tunisia. And this is why it is an attempt which is going on for some weeks to try to strike a deal with the uh, government in Tunisia that would encompass several components. It's not only management of migratory flows, it's also macroeconomic stability, it's the objective of relaunching trade and investments, and it's the idea of assisting Tunisia in uh, energy transition. Uh, there are some obstacles. Uh, I think. Uh, that uh, these are the uh, real problems that need to be solved before the deal can be uh, defined between you and Tunisia. And I very much hope that this visit will help solving the last remaining problems. Italy's Prime Minister, uh, Ferdinando, has urged the IMF to uh, relax uh, the terms of uh, the, the financial deal, the loan uh, to uh, Tunisia. Do you think the IMF will do that? Um, so, again, um, some problems in understanding your question, but uh, IMF has its own rules and it's up to the board of the IMF to decide on whether or not the conditions are met so as to be uh, able for the IMF to deliver the assistance which has been promised, which has been under negotiation for quite some time. Uh, uh, Governments in Europe are certainly supporting the idea of the loan will be awarded by the IMF to the Tunisian government, but it's not only the Europeans that make the decision in the board of the IMF. So uh, I'm afraid that there will be still some problems that need to be solved before uh, an agreement can be reached between the IMF and the Tunisian government. And this, in turn, is precondition for the EU to deliver the promised assistance of 900 million euro to the Tunisian government for uh, macroeconomic stability. The EU cannot deliver this assistance unless there is an agreement with the IMF. Reem, as we said, 150 million euros uh, as part of this 900 million euro package to help Tunisia address uh, migration. Um, 
What do you think of it? Is that a good idea or, or not? Is it going to ease the migrant crisis or make it worse? I think it's going to make the migrant crisis worse because um, just throwing money at the issue is not going to solve it. Uh, I think lately, with the current uh, and ongoing migrant crisis in Tunisia, we're seeing how migrants are being treated and how their human rights are being compromised. So with uh, striking this new deal, I think the migration crisis will worsen, uh, especially with the uh, waves of deportation that are going to happen consequently and the, what they call the, the readmission uh, process. Uh, so I don't think it's only a financial problem, but it's a lack of uh, a certain strategy that is concerned with the human rights of migrants, especially that migrants in Europe or in Tunisia are antagonized and often treated poorly and looked down on and condescended. So I don't think it's it's um, it's a very good idea to do this. So what what, is, what lies behind the compromise then of the, the human rights of, uh, of the migrants uh, right now? Yes, because right now we're seeing. Uh, for the past few weeks, we've been seeing waves of deportation uh, for sub-Saharan migrants in, in uh, Tunisia, for instance. And these violations um, compromise their physical safety. We've seen uh, hundreds of migrants st stranded on the Tunisian-Libyan and the Tunisian-Algerian uh, border without water, uh, without food. Uh, we've seen children, uh, pregnant women, people who are in a very critical uh, health condition. And human uh, rights organizations have little to no control on the situation and we're trying to salvage it. So with the new waves of deportation from Europe, uh, including Tunisian uh, migrants and, and, and other nationalities, is, gonna, is only going to worsen uh, the situation because of the lack of a strategy uh, that takes into account uh, the human rights of these individuals. Because we're not talking about international deals solely. This is concerned with the human lives and human beings who are, who are who, who, whose their livelihood is at stake. So, yes. Tarek, um, shouldn't the EU be improving its, its own uh, migration policies and, and its uh, attitude to their human rights, making it easier for migrants to reach the EU before... Uh, paying other countries to stem the flow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this this deal with with Tunisia uh, is EU migration policy in itself. Um, and as Reem was saying, the the situation of of sub-Saharan migrants that are passing through Tunisia, or even were just staying and living and working in in Tunisia, is um, is appalling. Uh, it's inhumane. Uh, as we speak now, they are dying on the borders uh, where they had been forcibly stranded. Uh, and so for the EU to, to now rush to come back to Tunisia, because even a few days ago, you know, the European Commission was, was briefing the press that uh, there had been no, no progress on this deal. So to now rush back to Tunis in these conditions to try to put pen to paper on the deal, um, it shows you how how EU migration policy is unfortunately born of desperation. And, uh, you know, when this broader memorandum of understanding was first raised uh, back in June, uh, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said that the migration component would be implemented with full respect to human rights or something to that effect. Uh, and unfortunately, it seems like, you know, there will be no clear conditions, no clear stipulations on this, if it is to be rushed through as we are being led to believe right now. Um, you know, instead of, of uh, trying to externalize the management of this problem to Tunisia, to Libya, to other countries that are, are clearly incapable of doing so without severe human rights abuses, um, the European Union and European member states should be trying to take control of this issue themselves. They should be trying to manage this issue themselves, uh, and it would be far more effective for them to do so. And I believe that it would also quell a lot of the anxiety within Europe that comes from seeing migr from from seeing migrants arrive uh, on boats and through people smugglers, because then their governments would be taking much more control of this issue instead of abandoning the issue to to dictators, to militias, and to people smugglers. You talk about the anxiety within Europe. Uh, with people seeing these migrants arriving on, on their shores. Um, one understands that Europe needs to, to manage migration, to make it more orderly and structured. 
so that people don't lose their lives trying to get there. But, I mean, the fact is the EU needs these people, doesn't it? It needs more skilled workers right now. Yeah, I mean, um, go to Germany, go to Italy, uh, even the United Kingdom, and there are huge labor shortages right now. Uh, there is a dire need for migrants. Um, and, you know, the, the reason why I, I framed my last response as I did is because you know, Europe is not in the position it is now due to a lack of policy options. There are plenty of policy options for creating safe and legal routes for, for refugees uh, and for better organizing and processing migrants. Uh, it's not a policy problem that Europe has, it's a political problem. Politicians are too scared to even discuss these policies, uh, let alone try to, to adopt and advocate them, because they believe that to do so would be political suicide. Uh, because since the early 1990s, uh, European governments have been kind of ceding ground slowly and slowly to the far right in a bid to appease them on this topic, which has always been very explosive in, in the public arena. Uh, and so, you know, gradually, bit by bit, uh, they've essentially painted themselves into a corner now, 30 years later, where they can't use any of the policy tools at their disposal to solve the problem, because they believe to do so would be to, to lose a debate that has been stacked against them for the last 30 years. Um, but to not do so will just make the problem worse and worse, uh, and much more important than any politics, it will continue to lead to the deaths of thousands of people every year. Ferdinando, do you agree with that? To what extent is EU policy on migration being dictated right now by uh, the rise of far-right parties in, in both national uh, parliaments and in the EU parliament itself? Definitely yes, because the uh, migration phenomenon, migration has been exploited quite clearly by rightist political parties in probably all European countries, more in some than in others, but this is a phenomenon which is quite evident in most European countries. And as a matter of fact, there is a contradiction or a paradox, because most European countries need migrants. Their job market desperately need migrants, both in the agricultural sector, in the tourism sector, for instance, in a country like Italy, or in other sectors as well. What can be what cannot be afforded by European countries is migration which is not managed, which is not regulated. So the ideal solution would be uh, a broad agreement between countries that are doomed or destined to receive migrants and countries of origin, so as to be uh, possible to manage migration flows and make it possible for migrants to fill the uh, vacancies that exist in our job markets. Um, it's not easy. I fully understand <clears throat> that uh, the problem is rather complex to settle and to regulate. But uh, there is a need to understand on both sides, I mean, uh, from the north and from the south, that migration is a structural phenomenon that can only be managed through agreed solutions. But the migrant uh, workers are needed in most European countries. Uh, the only, not the only, the main problem is how to regulate this phenomenon in a manner that would make it politically uh, sustainable in most European countries, and so that migration and migrant flows would not increase the support for rightist political parties. Reem, has the EU lost its moral compass in terms of its attitude to migrants and refugees? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, uh, the, the sound cut off in the middle. Has the EU lost its moral compass in terms of its attitude to migrants and refugees? Yes, I mean, with the, we've seen what happened lately uh, with the waves of, of, of migrants who... Uh, I, I think Europe is notorious for the way it, it has been treating migrants all along. It, it has lost its moral compass. I think um, migrants are not seen as human beings who are who have been pushed by their economic conditions to to take on to the sea and and, and risk their lives in the search of a better life, but as this threat to the security of Europe, and they have been treated accordingly. Uh, we've seen uh, how people who try to rescue migrants uh, have been uh, condemned uh, in Europe, uh, as of what happened lately. 
so yes, I think Europe has lost its moral compass when uh, dealing with migrants because they're not looked at as human beings anymore. They're looked at as this political uh, problem that needs to be salvaged and uh, solved through uh, international deals and protecting borders. But as we, as we were hearing, Reem, um, Europe needs these people. It needs skilled labour. To what extent is this a mm -hmm. PR problem that, that falls squarely, or the responsibility for which falls squarely with European governments and the EU itself, in that it needs to sell the issue of migration uh, to people uh, better? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's not about selling the, the, the issue. It, it is a PR problem to them, sadly, uh, that human experience has become a PR issue and a political debate. Uh, however, the, the issue with even with regulated migration is is very complicated and complex. It's it's not very accessible, and I can tell you that even people who try to migrate through the legal uh, means find the whole procedure very humiliating with the paperwork and the interviews and everything that you have to provide. So. I think the EU needs a whole new perspective when it comes to migration, a way uh, that protects the dignity and respects the human life that it's going to its uh, borders to, to search for labor, to search for a better life or to search for, for jobs, basically. Uh, Tarek, when uh, you talked about uh, um, uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen uh, earlier in one of your answers, when she announced this Tunisia deal. She said that it would be a model for EU migration. I mean, what do you think she meant by that? Is it even something to, to crow about? Do EU leaders genuinely think they're doing the right thing here, or are they doing this to appease? As you talked about the rise of the far right, you know, growing concern and criticism from right-wing politicians and, and the EU citizens who have begun to vote for them in, in larger numbers. I think it's a it's a bit of both. Um, so some of it is, is is playing to the crowd, is is signifying. I mean, for von der Leyen, she's signifying to the the new centre right, far right bloc in the European Parliament that she is taking this issue seriously and she's dealing with it how they would have liked to deal with it. Um, but you know, before this MOU or this deal was being set up to be the future model of EU migration deals. Uh, the Italian deal with uh, the Libyan government of national accord in, in 2016 or 17, dubbed the Miniti deal uh, after the foreign, uh, after the interior minister, uh, and the EU deal with Turkey uh, to stem the flow of Syrian refugees were considered the model for for European migration policy in the region. So this is very much just a a continuation of that. Uh, and you know, if you speak to um, to the technocrats or or to those you know at the most senior levels who are who are dealing with this policy, they do believe that it has been successful, you know that it has stopped or it has lowered numbers um, of migrants of refugees crossing into Europe, which I think speaks more to the to the very limited and and dehumanized way that they look at this problem, um, but also to the short termism with which the problem is framed. I mean, if you look at the statistics from the International Organization of Migration and, and from human rights organizations, uh, none of these deals have done anything to stem the number of migrants um, that are coming. What it has done is to increase the number of deaths uh, in the Mediterranean Sea uh, and in other routes that, that people are taking towards uh, Europe. So it's just made their lives more miserable. Um, and, you know, as we see now, uh, they made these deals before and they're back making more deals because Europe is essentially externalizing this problem. It is offering to pay large amounts of money to other people to manage the migration crisis for them. These people know uh, that this issue is very sensitive to the Europeans. And so it's almost like Europe has gotten itself into an extortion racket of sorts. And so the cost of keeping migrants away from Europe are you know, they will keep going up and up. Uh, even now, after the deal with Libya was made, you have um, new uh, pressures coming from Eastern Libya this time. You have President Said in, in Tunisia trying to leverage the migration issue. President Sisi in Egypt is trying to leverage the migration issue. Uh, and so, you know, the longer that Europe keeps using these kind of deals as a model, 
yeah. the more it is just advertising itself as okay. open to extortion on this. Ferdinando, what, what do you make of that? that? You know, that this has become almost an extortion racket for the EU. Have Europe's politicians and citizens become inured to the scale of the human tragedy here? Disasters that would once have sparked moral outrage now seem to provoke, all right, much wringing of hands and expressions of regret uh, before being quickly forgotten or swept under the carpet. Would you agree? I, I'm not sure I've got correctly your question because the audio is very poor, but uh, I agree with what has been said before that the European Union, which has not been able to find uh, agreeable solutions to deal with migration internally uh, with a sort of burden sharing between European countries in the, in the acceptance of migrants has been rather more, if I may say so, successful in externalizing the problem, uh, asking countries of transit in particular to take care of the problem. The case of Turkey has been the first one, which has been quoted, and it's correct. We've tried to do the same with Libya, and now we're trying to do something similar with Tunisia. This is the sign that uh, the problem is very difficult to manage. I fully understand all the considerations, I share all the considerations that have been uh, quoted before by other speakers that have intervened before me on the need to guarantee uh, these people that live in their countries uh, human conditions and respect for basic fundamental human rights. But on the other hand, uh, there is a problem that these uh, flows of migrants, unless they are in some ways managed and regulated, they are becoming politically unsustainable, even though probably in terms of numbers, they okay. could be sustainable. But right. since they are exploited systematically from a political point of view, it's becoming very complicated for governments to deal with the phenomenon without, without the assistance of countries of transit. Okay. Now, uh, it's uh, very right. complicated Fernando, to get... Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, but we're, we're almost out of time. I want to get one more question in for Reem. Reem, two years ago, in a report entitled Lethal Disregard, the UN Rights Office of the High Commissioner said that the lack of human rights protection for migrants crossing the central Mediterranean is not a tragic anomaly, but rather a consequence of concrete policy decisions and practices by the European Union member states and institutions and other actors. I mean, nothing's changed in two years. I put the same question to you. Have uh, Europe's politicians become inured to the, to the, to the human tragedy here? Yes, I, I think uh, lack of certain policies that protect uh, the human rights of, of migrants is a direct factor. Uh, either from the part of the, the European Union or from our side. Uh, I think uh, putting in place laws and regulations and uh, studying the current condition and what leads people to take on um, such, you know, to decide to, to, to leave to Europe is, is, is the way to, to salvage the situation. But I agree that uh, the poor decision making that happened uh, from both sides, and the total disregard for for human life and and, and human rights is, is what led to this crisis. Uh, I I'm I'm going to repeat myself again, but I think it's important uh, when you look at the migration crisis as a as purely as a political issue and not as a human rights issue, that's where you kind of lose your moral okay. compass. That's where, yeah. All right, there, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it. Many thanks indeed, uh, Ferdinando Nelly Ferrocci, Reem Garfi and Tarek Mejrisi. And uh, thank you for watching. You can see the program again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, Join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.